Awesome. Hi, everybody. Thanks again for taking time out of your day to join us for another installment of our Customer Care Hour series. For those that may be joining us for the first time, welcome. My name is Thad. I am on the customer success team here at Care Message. And what this is, is a one hour or so discussion that we host twice a month uh, just for Care Message customers and, and users like all of you. Um, what we try to do is create a space where we can get together on a regular basis, share insights from across primarily the FQHC and free clinic space, share updates about what's happening at Care Message. And sometimes on days like today, we are fortunate enough to welcome in a guest speaker to lead a presentation. Uh, and to introduce today's guest, I will go ahead and turn it over to a uh, familiar and friendly face, uh, Care Message CMO, Dr. Tracy Angelosi. Hey, Tracy. Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Well, we're excited today to have Dr. Derek Griffith with, with us. Dr. Griffith is a founding co-director of the Racial Justice Institute and the founder and director of the Center for Men's Health Equity. Both of those are at Georgetown University, where Dr. Griffith is a professor of health management and policy and oncology. He's trained in psychology and public health, and his research focuses on developing strategies to achieve race racial, ethnic, and gender equity in health, and he specializes in Black men's health promotion and on interventions that mitigate the effects of structural racism on health. He also serves as the chair on Global Action on Men's Health, which is an international organization founded 10 years ago with a mission to create health equity for all men and boys. Um, and Dr. Griffiths is a contributor to and editor of three books and the author of over 150 peer-reviewed manuscripts. Recently, he received a citation from the president of the American Psychological Association for his extraordinary leadership in addressing the impacts of racism on health and well being of the nation, and specifically for African American and Latino men. So, we are super honored to have Dr. Griffith with, with us today, and I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to him. Well, thank you so much. Um, I appreciate your. Um, indulgence, um, and I know that this was a long time coming, and so Dr. Angelosi, uh, Angelosi uh, thank you for, you know, continuing to be persistent with me and patient with me as I know we had the hiccup last month or so, um, so thanks for making time again for me to join you. Um, let me get this queued up as we get ready to jump in here. Okay. So, Again, let me say my thank you to all of you for joining today. Um, hopefully, um, we'll, I definitely will save time for Q&A and discussion at the end. Um, I'm gonna talk about, I was asked to sort of talk about um, men's health in general and to think about really the ways that we um, are thinking about um, disease prevention, men's health promotion, and how to, particularly for men with chronic diseases, how to think about sort of their health and well-being. So what I'm gonna do is sort of talk through some of the, the work and the approaches and so forth, um, really more just kind of more from a theoretical standpoint of how we sort of might think about these issues and how, what are some things that you might actually do to be able to incorporate into the work that you do. So let me first start though by acknowledging my team here um, th at the Center for Mental Health Equity who have, you know, um, they basically are behind the scenes doing all the heavy lifting while I um, get to go have fun with folks like you. Um, and so we have our three core projects. Um, the AIMCCI is actually one that is on um, fatherhood and it's basically with um, the National Healthy Start Association, other federally qualified health and working with um, FQHCs and, and related organizations to create non-hospital bundles to help support fathers um, as they try to support mothers in the birth in the maternal child health sort of space and particularly in that um, conception to um, first year of life sort of period. And so what are the things that we need to do to create spaces for fathers to to um, support mothers in those in that time period? Um, Fit Brothers is, is an app to promote physical activity and physical activity maintenance, and then Mighty Men is our large community-based organization, a community-based intervention trial trying to promote physical activity that actually does use an app. I won't get into the weeds of that today. Um, I know you all do a lot of text and text messaging and so forth, but we can talk about that at the end um, as we see that. 
So I'm going to start in a little bit of an unusual place, but um, you know, I I grew up a child of um, hip hop, and now that we're at sort of the 50th anniversary, um, you know. And so I always, I, this is kind of, I get to sort of cheat and do kind of things I want. So you have liberties as a, as a presenter. And so this is just one of mine. But I still think this is a very relevant um, quote from Tupac. Um, again, how many of, how often are you going to say that you actually saw a Tupac quote as, as part of a presentation? Um, so, you know, check off that of, of your bucket list. But he has this song uh, with Scarface, and this quote is, there's going to be some stuff that's going to make it hard to smile in the future, but whatever you see going through all the rain and the pain, you got to keep your sense of humor. You got to be able to smile through all that stuff and just remember that. And I start there because if you think about, one of the things I want to talk about is sort of how men think about health relative to the other aspects of their lives and other aspects of their health and well-being. And that we often tend to separate health and well-being from the larger sort of focus and ways of thinking about well-being, health promotion, um, and just their goals in life. And what I'm suggesting is that we have to think about how men are approaching these issues if we're going to be successful in helping them to intervene, helping to intervene and to promote their health and well-being in their lives. Another quote just as um, that I think is helpful for men when I've done talks and so forth is, that we're important, but not indispensable. And so a lot of times men in their lives and families will um, treat it as though if they don't sort of, if they can't succeed in the roles and responsibilities that they have, that they may not see themselves, they, they will think that the whole family will fail. And so they will put themselves in places and positions that are not necessarily um, accurate, but nonetheless, they take on an additional burden that they may not sort of be able to bear. And it gets in the way of their ability to sort of strike a balance and do things where they take care of themselves in addition to taking care of their health and well-being. And so to illustrate this point a bit more, I'm going to use the story of John Henry. This may be familiar to some, um, but just as to illustrate this core, core point, um, John Henry was known as sort of the steel driving man. There's this fable of he lived in some sort of coal mining sort of town. His job was to bore holes in the mountain when they were sort of doing the man versus machine during sort of the industrial period. And job was to bore holes in the mountain to put explosives in to basically be able to make tracks for the railroad. And so he was known as being um, the strongest man, you know, sort of in his area. Um, he was particularly good at being able to do this and particularly good at his chosen profession of doing this. And so there was this race of man versus machine where they were sort of questioning, you know, who would be able to do this faster, him with his hammer or a um, steam power drill that would sort of also bore the hole to the mountain. The positive part of the story that you may be familiar with is at the end, he won. He actually beat the machine. And so in this race of man versus machine, he actually did beat the machine. And so you have this narrative that has emerged that is paralleling what some have sort of brought up in other contexts, where you have this person who is hardworking, ambitious, ambitious optimistic, persistent, and trying to do things that are good for themselves and their communities. And so they're trying to lift as, they, as you climb, if you will. And um, they're the first people in the context of COVID, it became particularly challenging to understand how particularly black men were dying at such a high rate and what was the cost of that. And so this is where this story sort of came up in that particular context. And so this idea of John Henryism is and physical vigor and a commitment to hard work. Why does all that matter? It's because at the end of the story, what we tend to sort of forget is he was very successful in his chosen profession, but his strategy for dealing with the problem was basically just to put his head down and continue to just work as hard as possible without thinking about what are the consequences of doing that or to think about other strategies for the problem that he faced and the challenge that he was facing in his chosen job. So while he was successful in his job, it also cost him his life. 
And because he was prioritizing more of his professional success than his own health and wasn't really trying to balance the two, that he struggled, he basically died at the end. And he literally died on the tracks. And in some versions of the story, his wife and, and son were there on the tracks and witnessing this. And so you can see the same sort of socialization messaging also transpiring and perpetuating across generations as well. So the, I start here with this sadly morbid story. Um, to, to highlight that on the one hand, we celebrate him and usually remember this story and usually remember John Henry as someone who was successful. He epitomizes all of the things that we want in terms of personal responsibility, in terms of strength and focus and determination and all of those kind of positive characteristics that we want of adults. Yet it cost him his life. And so we have these dual messages that we are that we are drug, dealing with when we talk about men's health. We want men to focus on being successful in their chosen profession, prioritize those kinds of things. And we almost, we you know, again, we remember him usually positively, despite the fact that he died at the end. Um, just, you know, and, and for all the success that he had and for the characteristics of what he represented. And so the, the point here is that we get these, the, the mixed message is that we want men to be successful, but then we also say that health is important. But we often don't forget, we often sort of miss the fact that health in, in many cases and in the minds of men and, and how they're valued sometimes by their families, by their communities, by our larger society, you're more, you're more valued for what you do than necessary for taking care of and prioritizing your own individual health. I'm way too much of a football fan, and this is a bit old, but it still, I think, makes the point that we saw this with football players as well, just so you don't think this is just sort of this, you know, fable that I'm just pulling out of nowhere. So um, about 10 years ago, um, the NFL, went through, they that was sort of the time when they had the concussion protocols and they had the, um, the, 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 settlement with the Players Association and the NFL, where they were trying to change how people actually um, hit so that you would have less concussions, less um, CTE and so forth. But you had players who were actually pushing back against that at the time. Um, you see less of this explicitly now, but at the time you had a lot of folks pushing back and saying, well, I'd rather have a concussion than I would have a leg injury. Um, a leg injury, you may basically end your career. You won't come, you can't come back from that. From a concussion, you can come back in a couple of weeks. So they were more willing to, and again, you have to sort of sit with that for a second. You're more willing to have long-term brain damage and all the potential consequences of that than you are to end your career, which you, you know, again, you've put a lot of energy and effort into, into promoting your career and well-being, but you're more willing to deal with that than you are. Um, thinking about your long-term health and well-being. A similar story, um, again, um, by Tony Gonzalez, um, you know, I'd rather have a guy hit me in my head than knife at my knee. So you'd rather, again, uh, risk long-term brain damage, injury, and so forth than they would necessarily. Um, yeah, the movie Concussion was great about this topic, absolutely. Um, and so the, in case you all are interested, that whole, there's ser several documentaries, but definitely the the movie where Will Smith um, starred as the, um, the doctor who basically started diagnosing CTE and so forth, um, really brings this home in just the personal and the family context of how this is harmful to people um, and their community is really, a, it's a really precedent sort of point. Um, but it's it's the point is people are making choices, men are making these choices, and it's not limited to this old sort of fable and story. You're seeing it in football, but you also see it in life. And so the point is that often these are the ways that we prioritize and balance how men thinking about health. And when we tend to prioritize health or when we give messages, where I'm going with this, let me just be clear. When we give messages in a health center, in a health space, in a, in a clinical space to men about you should prioritize your health, you should take care of your health, you should focus on making sure that you're going to the doctor, making sure you're getting preventive care, you know, taking care of your own health and well-being, making sure you're eating right. Health is only one of the many things that are important. 
And often men um, treat health as though it's what we call an instrumental value. It only matters, health is important because it allows you to do things that actually are important to your life, your career, and your overall well-being. So it's important because if I'm healthy, then I can um, be involved in, you know, helping to, to create some kind of financial wealth for my family and support, contribute to financially to a household. I can have a career and be successful in that. I can help to manage my household and be part of that household and make sure that I am um, a part of that community and being part of that family to help take care of others. Um, and I can do other things. But health is in and of itself for a lot of people and a lot of men, not necessarily important unless it gets in the way of their ability to do things that are, are important to their lives and, and to their families. And so you have this way of men sort of thinking about health and the way that we do messaging as it relates to health. This was actually a real campaign. Um, the no, we don't part was not part of it, but this year, thousands of men will die from stubbornness was actually a AHRQ, as you can see here, campaign about preventive health care for men. This was probably, I think more like 15 years ago, but I still love this. Um, the That particular quote, and then of course the, the response that we see um, you know, uh, uh, from, I'm going to make this up, a man, um, I have no idea, but um, the point is that we tend to look at men's health and why men don't do things through the lens of, oh, it's all within men's health care needs, it's all within men's control, and that we only sort of look at the problem as though men have the problem and men are the problem. And in the problem, the fundamental problem that we tend to identify in men's health, or we tend to frame as a healthcare system and, and the way that we approach it is that men are the problem. And the way that men think about masculinity, the way that men think about health and healthcare, that that's fundamentally the problem. And if we would just fix that and men would just do what we tell them to do, or particularly often sometimes do what women tell them to do, then, or loved ones tell them to do, then life would be better. You know, all of the men's health problems would go away and all the reasons that men die prematurely would also go away. And what I'm trying to say is that is partially true, but that is not the complete full story. And so we've got to understand, again, the mixed messages that we're giving men, that we're telling them, no, we really need you to be part of that, you know, active and, and um, fulfilling members of a household and a family. We do need you to contribute financially to a household. No, this is not, you know, whatever decade in the past where you might have been the sole provider that that for many people is not realistic. But it is important to know that sometimes men are defined and define themselves by their ability to fulfill these roles more so than the, they are necessarily their ability to be healthy and so forth. And so you have these quotes, again, this is not unique to Black men, and I should have said this more explicitly. I'm going to focus on Black men primarily because that's more of my area of expertise and more of where I've done the actual work with Black men, and you'll see quotes from Black men. Um, but I've seen, and just in when I've done these talks and so forth, that a lot of resonance with these messages and information and the ways of thinking seem to resonate and be consistent with men of all racial and ethnic groups. And again, even if you think about sexual orientation, identity and gender identity and so forth, what tends to kill those who are of whatever sexual identity orientation and so forth tends to be the same things that kills everybody else. So those who are under the essentially what I would say men's health umbrella, regardless of again, gender identity or sexual orientation um, and those kind of factors, they're still more likely to die of heart disease and cancer than they are from any other things that we're talking about. And they tend to still embody and take on these kinds of norms, beliefs, and attitudes that have consequences and sort of see themselves through that particular consequence in ways that we really need to understand how that has implications for how they prioritize health or not. One of the things that we did that was interesting in terms of the qualitative work, we did a paper some years ago now that looked at the connection between and the parallels between how men defined what it meant to be healthy and how men defined what, what manhood meant. So as opposed to masculinity being something that is an idea that um, we have these gendered ideals, these, these ways of thinking about the way that we rank order, thinking about men versus women and just men in our society. We have ways of thinking about um, the ways that men think about what gender means and what roles men should play um, 
status, power, privilege, and those kind of factors in our society, manhood is really more about how do men understand that um, for themselves. Manhood is really more about how, how do you sort of take these principles that for masculinity is basically the same if you're 80 and if you're if you're eight and if you're 80. And those kind of structural conditions and the ways that people define it doesn't really, you don't think about sort of the age related priorities and how that fits in there. Manhood is trying to think about what is the unique constellation of factors and the ways of thinking that combines these ideas of masculinity with the age appropriate ways of thinking about the norms and expectations of when you reach adulthood, what do we expect people to be able to do? And in the context of men's lives, you know, we thought about it, we found from talking to them that these three things emerged. So both manhood and how you define yourself as a man and whether or not you see yourself as a man and as an adult male um, had parallels between that and how they define health, meaning that being healthy and being a man both embod meant embodying certain characteristics. So being healthy, in this, as you see in the quote, meant you know, being able to do things where you're still remaining independent, you're still being supportive of others, and you're still able to accomplish things that are important to you. It also is about what you do and what kinds of behaviors you engage in. And so health is the ability to not just sort of be able to be functional, but to have enough energy to perform eight to 10 hours of labor a day, and then not just sort of collapse on the couch when you get home, but to have enough energy, like if I'm ideally healthy, then I can you know, do my job and then still be active as a member of my family, as opposed to being part of the beanbag furniture for your kids when you get home. Like you, you, you know, and they can just jump on you, whatever, as opposed to you being able to actively engage with people. And then how you seek to affect others, this relational definition that both in terms of what it means to be a man and what it means to be healthy is not usually for men just about whether or not they have, you know, a healthy A1C level, whether or not their blood pressure is under control and whether or not they're at a healthy weight. It means they're able to do things for others and in the context of the lives of others that they care about. And if, whether it's fulfilling work-related roles or whether it's, again, being active in their families, but this idea that it's defined in relation to others in their lives and other goals and aspirations that they have, that that is both what a man means and what it means to be healthy. And so when we think about this, um, Again, you have this idea that, you know, men weren't, aren't necessarily worried about their health and you're more worried about your family. You know, again, these are quotes from um, various focus groups and interview studies that we've done in the past. Um, but in other words, in this, as, as one of the participants said, his family came first, his health came second. And so he didn't really worry about his health again, as I was sort of describing as an instrumental value. He didn't really worry about his health until it got in the way, until it was his later years when it started to become a problem. Um, we talk about how, you know, defining a man, his character, identity, who he is, that's how he defined what it meant to be a man. What he gives of himself, the love, how much love and he's able to uh, give someone else and how much he's able to inspire someone. So again, these are not typical ways of thinking about um, and defining masculinity in the way that often you hear it. But if you talk to men about what these things mean to them and how they're, what are the aspirational goals that they have, you'll get a different picture. And that's kind of the one of the key points of what I'm trying to say today. The point here is that being healthy, we tend to, in a public health and medical community, tend to suggest that health is should be one, a universal goal. It should be the highest priority that people have, but it often doesn't, is not people's highest priority and certainly not men's highest priority. And that we have to recognize that being healthy and taking care of their health, managing chronic disease and preventing chronic disease often is something that is a priority that only comes after meeting competing goals, meaning again, often having to do with contributing financially to a household and doing those kinds of things that are much more sort of basic and instrumental. And so we have to recognize how these things fit together and how men are sort of socialized in that way as well. We talked about this in relation to fathers. Um, we did a piece some years, uh, I think three or four years ago. It was just um, republished um, around Father's Day this year that fathers need to care for themselves as well as their kids, but often don't. And it just talks about the same kind of idea 
that men will often prioritize their roles as fathers and the, these kind of instrumental things more than they will their own individual health. But their health often gets in the way when they do that, their health often gets in the way of their ability to fulfill those roles. So it becomes this sort of um, self-fulfilling prophecy and cycle that is unhealthy. One of the other things I wanted to make sure that I highlighted in this time um, is that how men express themselves tend to look, it may look a little different. And so we did a paper, again, this is a while ago now, 10 years ago, that looked at how men talked about and experienced depression. And um, one of my former doctoral students did a did a her dissertation on um, gendered expressions of depression. And so what she did is there were a bunch of books and there are a bunch of books for those of you who are clinicians, as you probably well know, um, about the ways that clinicians look at and look at gendered expressions of depression. And she incorporated those in a and um, and pulled those from part of a, a nationally representative survey that um, looked at how those factors in terms of um, being able to look at psychiatric um, epidemiology, so the patterns of national patterns of mental health um, and disease. And what she basically pulled was that you know a lot of times we, th we the entry criteria for depression for major depressive episode major depressive di diagnosis is that you have to express sadness and depressed mood in the last two weeks. Well, we know that men are far less likely to express or admit in a in a clinical setting or any other setting that they are sad and depressed. But when you talk to them about well, have you started drinking more? Have you engaged in more risky behavior? Have you had more irritability, anger outbursts, and so forth? These are the kinds of symptoms that men are more likely to actually admit and that are mirroring a lot of the same kinds of things that we would see when you think about sadness and depressed mood. So they may be similar sort of characteristics. And we published this and included those criteria and relaxed the initial entry criteria that you didn't have to explicitly express sadness and depressed mood, that you actually looked at the constellation of, of symptoms that meant the difference between men and women, the two to one difference that men, that women are diagnosed with depression at twice the rate of men actually went away. And both of them would have been um, at least screened for depression since this is a, a nationally representative survey and we can get into the methods of how it's done. Um, and we can quibble about whether or not this is the same thing. It's, I'm not saying that these are diagnosing, but it is saying that this is how we actually capture the representative rates of psychiatric diagnosis in our country. And so in this particular nationally representative survey, which was done um, now 20 years ago, but we analyzed it 10, um, the difference between men and women went away. The major point here is we know that somehow or another men are underdiagnosed with depression um, because of the high rates of substance use, because of our high rates of dying by suicide. We know that these things are there, we just don't actually have a good way of capturing them. And so we can quibble about whether or not you characterize these things as depression. What we can't disagree about is that these men, whoever they are, whether how they're diagnosed, how they're being captured, is missing something in how we're actually, who needs help, we're missing. We're missing these men who are engaging in riskier behavior, who are engaging in more um, substance use, whether it's alcohol or other substances, who are more irritable, anger outbursts, being more aggressive, that those are men who we need to basically bring into services more. And whether you call it depression or not, um, we need to basically be able to wrap our arms around those men a bit more and provide more services for them and recognize that they need those that kind of support. Since you all do um, so much sort of text and, and um, technology-based um, intervention and communication, um, one of the last things I wanted to talk about was um, this project that I did with the Movember Foundation called Rooted, the Rooted and Rising Collective. And part of what I'm just highlighting here is the ways that we can be creative about engaging men in trying to change this way of thinking um, change our way of thinking and how to, to open these doors of conversation about how to help men strike this better balance between taking care of uh, professional responsibilities, family responsibilities, and taking care of their own mental health and well-being. 
And so in the context of this particular project, we worked with um, digital creators, basically people who have a very significant social media following. And because we were focused on um, the scary sort of increase in um, depression and um, again, dying by suicide in younger black men, those 18 to 24, 25 sort of age range, um, November identified 10 black men who had a collective social media following of about a million and a half followers um, and brought them into the study. And so I developed the, the mental well-being curriculum. We had somebody else who was an expert in um, business and, and basically technology-based businesses and so forth and being a social influencer and so forth. And so we sort of tag team the training of them and how to help them integrate um, self-care, mental well-being into their content and curriculum, as well as how to help them think about what that meant for their own particular lives and um, how to not how to get it into their content, but also how to help them um, bring it into their lives as well. They Their task was to basically, after the curriculum, to create each of them two pieces of content that were about three to five minutes each um, using their particular art whether it was, um, you saw the different types of art in their brief description, um, but using their voices to incorporate that kind of message and how that would actually work. Um, not only did they say, um, based on this pilot, and it was a small pilot, admittedly it's you know 10 guys and this is largely you know um, self-report, that those who, they said themselves that they were going to be more likely to incorporate this into their lives, mental well-being content and mental well-being as a priority for themselves. But they also, when they, the videos that they created relative to other videos that they created were two and a half times more likely, those who watched those videos when they were surveyed said they were more likely to embrace self-care and in service of mental, better mental well-being than those who basically, than, than when they watched other videos from those particular same people. So the point is it did start to have that, that impact where people started to at least pay attention to, okay, these are ways that I can start to think about these kind of basic issues. So the point is there are things we can do to address these issues and it can be creative. Like this is not, there's nothing magical about this. You could certainly do this potentially within the context of your networks. If you have young people um, or people who just have, you know, are particularly tech savvy or just creative, you know, bring in folks who do different types of performance art to create content that you can then also disseminate through your technology-based tools could be something that you would sort of work on and create that would be low cost, but potentially could have a lot of um, a lot of potential purchase and way to reach into the population and community that could be helpful. And particularly if you have the ask or the link to, can I connect to, you know, care message services sort of after that, this could be a way to reach into those populations that might be helpful. The last quick thing I wanna talk about is, um, Essentially, it's based on self-determination theory. And again, these are just more ideas of things that you can help to get to the concrete things of how do you actually help people to um, connect um, some of the more important things in their lives to health. So again, if part of the challenge that we have as a medical community and profession is disconnecting health from the other parts of people's lives, one of the things in motivational interviewing, self-determination theory, those kinds of concepts is helping people to connect your core values and life goals with the kind of health behaviors and health outcomes that we want them to engage in. And so this was just a list of values and goals. One of my mentors, colleagues, Ken Resnikow, came up with this list or pulled this together. Um, these are just you know a couple of examples, and I'm going to show you quickly a couple of things from um, a certain study that we did where we applied this in a in a uh, physical activity study. And so we had men essentially choose their top two to three goals and values. Uh, these are 26 men, so the numbers because we asked them to choose two two to three, they may not have. I mean, the the numbers are not going to add up to 26. But you saw things like good Christian, spiritual, be healthy, um, a good spouse or partner. You have all these different things that were important to them. And then we asked them to, how does achieving that 
um, how does being as healthy as you can be help you achieve those goals? And so they had to articulate that connection as opposed to you making the connection for them. Part of what you want them to do is they to make those connections for themselves and then you help to hold them so, you know, accountable to that or help to help reinforce that for them. But they have to come up with it themselves as opposed to you coming up with it for them. Often we do the work for people and then they don't see the connection because it's not really resonating with them in this way. But if you actually help them to come up with why is this important to you? What is your why? Who's sometimes what we say. And so that I can be a better parent. I can be more active with my children if I'm healthier. I can have more energy and clarity of mind. Um, just reading these different quotes. Um, I can be stronger and longer life. That's important to me. And so you have these different things of areas of life that men identified as things that would be better for them that were important to them. Everything from energy level, family life to intimate relationships and just life overall. So you have these different things that can be helpful and particularly for physical activity, you know, one of the things that they recognized was being more physically active could help to reduce stress. Yeah, a goal was sometimes to get off medications or even to improve their health, but you see that that was not the highest priority. The highest priority for them was managing their stress and energy level and productivity. So the point is, if you can tie these things more explicitly to the ways that men are prioritizing things in their lives, we may be more successful in doing that. Um, I'm going to stop here. I'm going to, this is just a, another sort of thing that highlights what kinds of things are motivating people. I'm going to skip this for now, but it's a fun story we can talk about in the Q&A of um, cookies, um, where they did a study where they looked at self-enhancing values. Like, how do you sort of connect people's values? Like, if you have these self-transcending values, relationships, community, spirituality, versus self-enhancing values, if you're able to prompt those, that people are often willing to engage in um, better health, um, greater self-control and so forth, if you're able to help them tap into those core values that are really fundamental to who they are. So again, going back to where we started, um, there can be things in life, we know that these men are gonna face challenges, adversity and so forth but we need to help them find the way to basically, you know, struggle through that, keep their sense of humor, smile through that and find ways to make sure that they're able to live through that because these things aren't gonna go away. So you have to help them find ways to navigate that and keep their perspective on those kinds of issues. So health may not be men's highest priority. It may be something that they think about after pursuing professional success and other areas of happiness. Health can come at the cost of success in professional areas in life, and we often celebrate and value men for prioritizing their health in that way. But we have to help them find a way to be healthy and pursue these goals and help them to think about how their life goals, core values, and so forth align. And so just to reinforce that taking care of themselves doesn't mean me first, it means them too. And successful people have figured this out. And so helping them to recognize, you know, even you see, you know, the presidents usually before they got to the ages that they are now, that often you would see them exercising, you know, running and doing those kind of things. If the president and other folks who are successful are managing to find time to, you know, exercise, take vacations and so forth, um, again, that is not always financially feasible for people, but exercising and certainly self-care can be part of what we ask people to do, that they can recognize that they need to do that if other successful people can do that as well. So how, how can they do that within the resources that they have, take care of themselves and take care of their lives, as, which is a way to help them take care of the things that they uh, prioritize and take and that are important to them. So we want them to feel like they can leave this legacy of the world being better than the way that they entered it. And it's about thinking about those things and those consequences as we look forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Griffith. That was great. Loved all the sports and hip hop references. Appreciate that. Um, at this point, we are uh, in Q&A. So if there are any questions for Dr. Griffith, please feel free to just 
go ahead and, and come off mute. Um, you can also drop questions into the chat. Um, and we'll be more than happy to, to field those as they come in. And I'll just say as the next question comes in, yes, uh, Martin, um, I definitely agree um, that some ways that men express them, looking at the, the comment in the chat, men sometimes show um, or think of things as anger as though it's a sign of masculinity, knowing it actually may be not knowing or not recognizing it may be a sign of fragility or depression. That's exactly the point. And if we don't recognize that they're expressions of um some people are internalizers, some people are externalizers, and some people, when they externalize their frustration, depression, sadness, um, that those kinds of things may be externally expressed as opposed to looking inward and sort of, you know, withdrawing, that we don't recognize that those are actually signs of depression, anxiety, and so forth. And so if we recognize those are men that we need to pull in closer to us and potentially reach out to, that we won't, we will miss the opportunity to, to um, support men when they actually need it the most. I'm curious, uh, you were talking about um, like just telling men, hey, health is important is not really going to have the same effect as appealing to what they're their underlying goal is. So taking care of family and, and that sort of thing. So you're really trying to appeal to that. But then really interestingly, you brought up that you can't, like they may not respond to, if you really care about your kids or your spouse and you wanna take care of them, be healthy. Like you have to help them make that connection as opposed to just telling them that. Um, are there like any particular messages or messaging techniques that you've studied that that really work, especially it, like in our light of work when we're thinking about you know 160 to 320 characters. <laughs> to mm. that is that is there anything you can say in that short a bit, or, or should we be looking for like short little videos or something? You know, um, kind of interested in the the rooted and rising uh, project that you did is like actually what was that content that digital content that was created that that had such an impact? Sorry, that's probably a lot of questions all mixed together there. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm bad at multi part questions. So you're going to have to sort of prompt me with whatever what part I don't answer up front. But um, yeah, I think it's, 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 it's based on sort of motivational interviewing principles. So if you think about sort of those kinds of things, or for those of you familiar with self determination theory, which is basically the similar, they're kind of cousins, um, theoretically, where it's basically that you're trying to help people, it's hard to motivate people from for external reasons that you have to tap into for them what is the thing that's important to them why they want to change their behavior so if i'm doing it out of guilt and shame because if i don't take care of myself then i can't take care of my family and oh you're going to be a crappy father deadbeat dad if you're not taking care of this that and whatever that doesn't tend to motivate people it tends to just depress them and piss them off more so that it would make them sort of get into a shell versus what is the thing that is important to you? So it can be as simple, like it could be messages around what is the thing that's important to you that will help you? Um, what is the thing that's important to you that it's kind of a version of the question that I, that I put in there, of course, now I forgot what I said, but basically it's like, how does being healthier connect to the things that are important to you? How does, and literally it can be walking through that exercise that I did of, you know, here are, you know, a handful of, or they can come up with their own set of, you know, values and goals and so forth. And then the message may be, you know, what is a particularly important goal to you or value to you? And they can, you know, it can be sort of, um, you can have some of the back and forth in text, or you can sort of um, just have them do it themselves. But then you would follow it with, you um, describe or basically in however many characters why is this how does being healthy help you to achieve that goal or help you to live up to, to that value but it's basically they need to have the practice of just explicitly expressing that and then can you put that somewhere to remind you that this is why you're doing it when you don't want to go to the gym when you don't want to eat that healthier food option when you don't want to you know sleep because you 
you know, or wanting to do something you find more fun, this is, remind yourself, this is why you're doing this. And that's why you have this bigger goal that's in mind. So yes, we need to sort of help think through those kinds of things and give them those kind of tools. And it can be just the breaking it up into those push push messages um, that you could sort of have that back and forth. So if they respond, then you can sort of have the next one that comes or something like that. Um, but we haven't sort of done it in that way. We have the goal setting sort of in, in some of the work that we've done with the um, Mighty Men project and pilots that we've done in so in the past, we did use SMS text messaging. It wasn't, um, we didn't use the, we had an in-person curriculum or a virtual curriculum that we used. So it kind of went in parallel. So we didn't just do it sort of based just on the text messaging. So I can't speak to exactly how to do it just based on that. But it's kind of the point is, I think you're taking those principles and breaking them into to those 140 character sort of segments and having that sort of back and forth. And it can just be sort of the push pull, you know, respond one, two, and it'll, you know, you have that the way of doing that. That could be um, something that you would work through, you know, with men in, in, in your particular population. Uh, Griffin, great, great presentation. I got a thanks. question for you. It's something my friends and I, we always have oftentimes have a conversation about, but when it comes to getting adequate mental health care for black men, you know, what do you think of some of the barriers? Or can we discuss some of those barriers? Because that's something I think, you know, in our circle, especially with black men, we frown against going <laughs> therapy and uh, and all the that causes it i'm fighting with my friends now for exactly that and, and frankly losing the battle sometimes with with friends that i'm dealing with as as we speak um i think some of it is is you it's helping to reframe it like for I'm thinking of a particular friend right now who's struggling with just maintaining gainful employment and is really feeling the pressure, the financial pressure. And he is one that I would say has a very traditional ideal of masculinity of what he should be able to do for his family, like in his world, um, to be stereotypical and, and a bit whatever. Um, he has a, a, what I would call sort of a madman sort of 1950s sort of idea of masculinity where he should be the sole provider of sort of the family and what have you. And so his inability to do that has led him to feel like he's less than what he should be. And so his wife and I and others, friends of his have suggested, you know, why don't you go talk to somebody? This can help you sort of reframe but because he doesn't see the, the tangible connection between talking through these problems, getting that kind of support, and that doesn't give me a job, was, is basically his response. One is, is I, I don't have the money to do it. And two, it's, well, I don't see, how is that going to help me? I, it's, he's not giving me a job. He's not helping me find a job. The problem is the job. not pro The problem is not my mental health. And if I fix, you like, so it's helping to connect the dots a bit more and opening the idea that if you're actually better, you know, you have to still cope with these things while you're dealing with this idea of how you're going to get, when you, you know, how you're going to find the, the opportunity to get the job. And yeah. so you still have to deal with this stress. You still have to deal with this. It's not going to be a panacea and so forth. So it's it's hard. There's not really, I don't have a good magic sort of thing, but I think it's sometimes there's the confusion um and the the ten, the the tension and tussle that we do, you know, is that he wants it to be like a like you go into the doctor and they fix it, like it's surgery. You know, it's not something where you walk in and magically it's all fixed and you come out and it's done. Like this is not medication. Like, and so. Um, I think some of it is just the understanding of how are you willing to go through that process and take the time that it takes and see the the long term benefit of doing that and that it is you're willing to sort of prioritize that. And for a lot of men, because they're more immediately focused on what is it they need to get solved right now, 
that's not a there's not the willing to invest that kind of time, energy, and frankly, sometimes money to pay those copays or pay that money to do that. So it is finding a way to to strike that balance. Um, one thing we have found, um, and I've been surprised either whether I've done focus groups or just a lot of the reason we still do small group based interventions is because it's helpful for men to see that other men are experiencing the same thing that they are. And it's it's it tends to be normalizing because most of the men thinking that I'm the only one who's struggling to to contribute financially to my household. I'm the only one who's struggling to manage, you know, difficult kids. I'm the only one who's managing like making you know enough to be broke, you know, kind of things. Like I I don't like I'm the only one who's struggling with all these things. And when they see other men are dealing with that, and how are they coping with that? And can they help? Can they learn from somebody else? it tends to bring those kind of things together. But if you frame it as group therapy, then they're gonna be less likely to do it. But if you frame it as, oh, this is an exercise group, and oh, just by the way, we're gonna do some talking while you're exercising, or we're gonna do a little chatting while you, before you do that. That's how we've been able to spin this. That's why we frame a lot of the things as a physical activity intervention. And then we slide in those kind of things. It's kind of the edutainment sort of idea like, you know, if you're not paying attention, you might actually learn something kind of thing. So we try to have to slide it in the back door because they're not going to do it because it in and of itself is not a priority. But if I'm getting something valuable from it, then I may actually be willing to do it. Long answer to a short question. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you for that as well. I think that stigma in our community, especially with men, when something happens, the biggest thing we say, you got to man up. Or you got to toughen up or yeah. you know, built stronger than that. You can't do that. I'm not telling anybody else about my business, right. but I kind of framed it in the barbershop. And it's kind of interesting. And it may be very amateurish, but the thing is, you know, your car that you drive, you prize so much after a certain amount of miles, you need a tune up. You need an oil change. You need to rotate oh. your tires. But brother, you about 50,000 miles overdue. <laughs> that mean mm -hmm. that you're there because something wrong. Right. It's just to make sure you're aligning yourself to make sure that you're handling some of the things that you may not be aware of and you're expressing it in other ways. So thank you for that. Yeah. And that and the other thing is to reframe what man up means. Like manning up, actually, you're if you are a man and you don't know how to fix your car, if you can't rotate your own tires, if you don't have the equipment to do that, like it is you don't see it as a problem to go get your car fixed. You don't see it as a problem to have somebody else help you do that. So it why is it that it's okay in that other area where you see that as so important and not okay for you to get help for things that you can't physically do yourself in this space? Like we've got to help reframe what that man up sort of idea is. Manning up can actually mean getting the help that you need to be able to do the things that are important to you. So can you help them again, reframe, repackage those ideas and unlearn those unhealthy things that are getting in the way of their ability to live their fuller lives? Thank you so much for that. Got new information to be able to be armed with. All right, all right, let's go. Now, I told you I can't walk and chew gum, so I'm trying to actually read these messages while I'm looking at you all to see if, if, if what's here in the in the in the comments and chat. Um, There's a comment about telehealth and whether we oh, see that okay. as an opportunity to engage patients. Have we seen more men engage in preventive care, disease self management, and stuff with with the rise of telehealth with COVID, for example? I don't know because I haven't studied it. I would think so, just in the context of COVID. Like the, the one benefit of COVID is I think, you know, or one of the few benefits of COVID is I think it has normalized a lot of these kinds of telehealth and other resources and opportunities. So I would like to think so, that it has made those things more common and more accessible to people and honestly strengthened a lot of opportunities for um health systems to strengthen their resources and their offerings in that way too. So I would like to think so, um, but I honestly can't say that I have the data to support that, but I think it does make it more accessible. Um, in just my own life, when I've tried to encourage my friends, loved ones to get therapy and get you know counseling and talk to people, it is open the opportunities for them to talk to people who are not, um, if they have particular criteria that they want, say, 
they want it to be, you know, um, another black man, if they want it to be, you know, a lot of black men are more socialized. If you think about this, it's a little counterintuitive for some people that, you know, it's it can be on the one hand, a strength for black men to talk to another man. On the other hand, it can be um, a lot of the mental health things and a lot of the ways that we express vulnerability and so forth. We tend to do, you tend to learn to do that with women in your lives, not necessarily with other men. And so there can actually being having to express that to another man, being vulnerable in front of another man can actually for some men be more of a barrier because you've been socialized to do that with your mother, with sisters, with siblings, with nieces, nephews and nieces and so forth, with women in your lives, with partners and so forth. So we have to recognize who are you more comfortable sort of talking to and that telehealth has opened the door for them to talk to people who meet those other kinds of criteria and to expand the, the the possibilities of who you could actually reach and talk to. Yeah, that's super interesting points. I wonder also with telehealth, if there's a stigma of walking into a psychology office or a psychology oh, office, something like that, uh, yeah. you, you avoid that. Yeah, I mean, just even walking into a, a federally qualified health center, like I used to way back when worked in um, rural North Carolina and, there were the only services that were there for men were usually things either around um, sexual health, um, screening and, and treatment, or um, sometimes mental health. And so they were afraid that that if their car was parked in front of that facility, that they would be found out that they were there because like, and so they wouldn't go just because they were afraid that others would find out before they were willing to tell whoever it was why they were going to get help. And so in that often that actually, of course, you have those anecdotal stories of people saying that that happened. And of course, it reinforces it, you know, like, oh, no, 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 I don't want that to happen to me. So I just sort of avoid it. And so, yeah, those kind of things, I think it has definitely helped to reduce that stigma. You can, in the privacy of your own home, seek that kind of care and support or privacy of wherever you want to be to do that. Absolutely. I think it's helped in that way. Thank you so much, Dr. Griffith. I don't see any other questions in the chat and I'll just very quickly here at the bottom of the hour, share my screen to just take a look at uh, care hour sessions that are coming up. Thanks again, everybody for joining us today. Um, we are going to be taking the Tuesday after Labor Day off, but we will be returning on September 19th with a presentation and discussion with our product development team. They'll be sharing what it is that they've learned so far about our recent language expansion and where we'll be taking that work, along with what else is up next on our product roadmap. Um, on October 3rd, we will once again be joined and led by Dr. Angelosi on the topic of breast cancer screening and how your organizations can successfully drive screening rates throughout the year. Year, not just in October or Q4. So be sure to join us every other Tuesday for the most part. And uh, we're excited to see you all there. Again, very special thank you uh, to our guest speaker today, Dr. Derek Griffith. We really appreciate you taking the time. Thank you so much. Yep. Thank you, everybody. Hope you have Take a great care. rest of the day. Take care. Right. Yep. Bye.